Imagine a time when space was the biggest challenge out there. What if NASA didn't stop at landing at the moon? What if they aimed for Mars next using the technology they had in the 1970s? This idea, which seemed possible to some of the smartest rocket scientists back then, gives us a chance to think about a different kind of history. This is a story about what might have been, a tale of big dreams about living on Mars and how changes in the world stop these big plans. Let's dive into this exciting story of dreams, new ideas, and paths we didn't take in our journey to the stars. So what if we didn't stop exploring space? Could NASA have sent people to Mars using the technology they had back in the 1970s? Many top rocket experts of the time thought it was possible. They were so confident that they even made plans for people to live on Mars before the year 2000. Let's have some fun and look back at those old plans. This is the story of the mission to Mars that never happened. This is about the space race that could have gone further. We begin our journey in the 1940s with Dr. Werner von Braun. He's often called the father of rocket science. He was the main guy behind NASA's Apollo program, which made history by landing the first humans on the moon. Von Braun first worked on rockets for the infamous army in Germany. He developed the V-2 rocket, the first long-ranged guided missile. After World War II, he was brought to the U.S. under Operation Paperclip and initially worked for the U.S. Army on rocket technology. Later, he transitioned to NASA, where he became the director of the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. The U.S. hired many former German soldiers back then. Von Braun, in his spare time, wrote the 280-page book called Project Mars. It's about the first people going to Mars, like a science fiction story, but by a real rocket expert. The story is wild. It's about a future world united after a big war, kept peacefully by a powerful space weapon that can destroy anyone causing trouble. It seems you can't fully change a rocket scientist's past. Besides the story, Von Braun put all the math and plans for a Mars trip in his book. It is like a real guide to going to another planet by the man who planned the moon landing. Von Braun's ideas influenced a lot of science fiction, from 2001 A Space Odyssey to Star Wars to Elon Musk. Look at his Mars rocket design, and then at the Starship. According to Project Mars, the first step is to build big space stations near Earth that spin to create fake gravity. Then, build a big fleet of ships and landers for Mars in space. One of Von Braun's famous designs was the huge ferry rocket, a reusable space plane that could keep going back and forth from Earth, carrying stuff for the space fleet. The ships would have big round living areas and lots of fuel tanks, all powered by liquid rocket engines. Von Braun liked hyperbolic propellants, chemicals that burned when mixed. They're easy to use in space and still common today like the small engines on SpaceX's Dragon capsule. When ready, the Mars fleet would leave Earth's gravity and head straight for Mars, taking the shortest path about 260 days. As they got close to Mars, the ships would then slow down and go into orbit around Mars, 620 miles up. Then the landers would separate and glide through the atmosphere to land softly on Mars. The crew would then set up camp using supplies from the lander. These first people would explore Mars and start the first human colony. Then, they'd take off from Mars and meet the fleet in orbit to go back to Earth. Sounds doable, right? Back in the late 1940s, when this was made, it seemed very possible to smart rocket scientists. The main issue was we didn't know much about Mars back then. Werner von Braun a really smart scientist thought Mars had water channels, lots of plants, lakes, and even advanced aliens. He was mostly right in his ideas, but he missed a few big things. Mars doesn't have life, and its air is super thin, much less than Earth's. So Von Braun's idea of a huge plane with wings to land on Mars wouldn't have worked at all. In the late 1950s, people were planning how to send humans to Mars, and new tech was coming into play. 
in the US. It was the start of the nuclear age. They just figured out how to make electricity with nuclear power, and many thought it would give endless energy for things like space travel. Rocket experts were thinking about using this for spaceships going far into space. Dr. Ernst Stullinger, a friend of von Braun and former German soldier who worked for the US government, had updated von Braun's Mars plans for the nuclear age. He changed the chemical rockets from von Braun's idea to his own, spaceships powered by nuclear electric energy. Dr. Ernst's Mars idea was so respected that it was shown on American TV in 1957. Walt Disney had a show called Disneyland, which talked about many topics. One episode, Mars and Beyond, was about planets. It was cool animations guessing what aliens from Mercury, Mars, and Venus might look like. This showed how much people were curious about our solar system. In that show, Von Braun and Stullinger explained how humans might go to Mars. They showed models of Stullinger's nuclear electric spaceship. Like in Project Mars, chemical rockets would send parts of this big nuclear ship into space and be put together in space. The ship would be 500 feet wide and have a special vehicle for landing on Mars. At the bottom of the spaceship was the nuclear reactor. It made energy by splitting atoms. This heat turned silicone oil into steam, making the ship electricity. The big circle at the top cooled the steam back into liquid so it could be used again. The main engine was halfway down the ship. It had a grid of platinum that got energy from the steam. Then they would put in cesium metal, and its atoms would be shot out into space, pushing the spaceship forward. This was a slow push, but very efficient, and it could work the whole trip. This is how some space probes and satellites move today. So Stellinger was ahead of his time. At the top of the ship were places for cargo and up to 20 people. The Mars lander was attached to the front of the engine. When the main ship got to Mars, the lander would separate and use a parachute and rockets to land safely like NASA's latest Mars lander. After exploring Mars, the crew would use an ascent module to leave Mars, similar to how Apollo astronauts left the moon. The trip to Mars with this ship would take 13 months. It would need four months to get fast enough to leave Earth, seven months to reach Mars, and two more months to slow down and get into Mars orbit. Stellinger thought six of these ships would go on this long journey not knowing what they might find in Mars. Stullinger's tech was mostly good, and his ideas are still considered today. The biggest issue was the long travel time to Mars. It's too long for people to be in space because of low gravity and space radiation. But the ideas in Mars and beyond were heading in the right direction. In the 1960s, NASA was doing great with human space travel. They have sent the first American into space, reached orbit, and even done spacewalks with the Mercury and Gemini programs. The Apollo program was going strong, and Von Braun was finishing the Saturn V rocket to send the first men to the moon. This was a big moment for space travel, and NASA was already planning to send people to Mars, hoping to do it in the early 1980s. In the late 1960s, there was a lot of excitement about going to Mars. Many companies wanted to be part of this adventure. One of these companies was the Ford Motor Company, which even had an idea for a Mars transport system. But here, we'll talk about a special idea from Boeing, a company already big in space travel. Boeing's idea in 1968 was about a rocket and used nuclear power. This was different from another type of space engine we talked about before, which used nuclear power to make electricity. Boeing's plan was to use the heat from a nuclear reactor directly. They would take super cold liquid hydrogen and put it into the hot nuclear reactor. This would make the hydrogen turn into gas fast, and this gas would push out the engine, making the rocket move. This kind of engine was a mix of a regular rocket and the electric kind, making it powerful and efficient. For the Mars trip, Boeing suggested a two-stage rocket. The first part would get the rocket into space. Then, a three-person team would go into a special Mars module. 
This module would have an engine to lower it into Mars's atmosphere. Before landing, it would use a big parachute to slow down and then fire engines for a soft landing. After 30 days on Mars, the crew would leave part of the module behind and use the other part to lift off from Mars. This part had extra boosters to help it get off the ground. After that, the main engine would take it back to the main ship. Then, they would use another nuclear engine to start the trip back to Earth. When they got close to Earth, a special part of the ship would separate and land on the ocean. This whole plan was big and tough. It would need five huge Saturn V rockets just for one trip to Mars. There's a lot of resources for something that might not even work, but with the technology of the 1970s, it could have been possible. So why didn't NASA send people to Mars? Well, things had to change by the early 70s. President John F. Kennedy, who dreamed big about space, was no longer alive. His brother was also killed, which was tragic. The government had changed, the Republicans replacing Democrats. The Vietnam War was getting worse, and people were less interested in space. NASA had less money. President Richard Nixon had to choose between two plans, one to go to Mars and one to build a space shuttle. There wasn't enough money for both. What remarkable discoveries do you think we should have made if NASA's space exploration didn't stop at the moon and ventured towards Mars in the 1970s? Share your thoughts and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.